Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros. D'Anthony, um, we have a smarter guest than you today. I know, it's nice. Uh, you know, usually we have uh, imbeciles on the show. Yes, yes, like, yes. Like yes. you and others. And Correct. Uh, dummies, uh, yeah. porn stars. Oscar winners who were also done. You know, I mean, I feel like Matthew McConaughey is pretty smart. He's a pretty smart guy. Yeah. P- pretty smart guy. Not on, on Brian Keating's level. No. Um, Brian, you're a professor of uh, cosmology. When did you get into makeup? Yeah, since, well, you can <laughs> tell from my appearance, my coif, my coiffer, yeah. that it's... Uh, Especially important to me, right? It's funny. I usually say to people, I'm a physicist, and they say, that's why you're so bulked up. Phys ed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's our uh, booking agent, uh, Ari, actually did write cosmetology accidentally in the email. Yes. I'm like, oh, I was going to talk shit to him. I was like, yeah, I'll let that one go. I'm sure it <laughs> happens all of the time. It's um, just Apple auto-correcting. Yeah, like, it's all it is. Because yeah. there's not a lot of people who are in cosmology um that's right t- t- tell our audience who might not know what that is uh, exactly what being a p- professor of cosmology is well normally uh first of all is uh, this show is like rated g or i can't curse or anything like you that. can no, say no, anything you can, you, want. you can literally say Obviously, anything you want you know just better. like the just the opposite of the faculty club all right cool <laughs> you, yeah uh, yeah you can't <laughs> talk about uh the election though we found that out on youtube anything but the election yeah you're uh, good to go Oh, there's a certain, you know, something that rhymes with uh, Televid or, co- you know, anyway, we won't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not that kind of doctor, although I will prescribe medication if you guys are good. Oh really? yeah, we, we can, we always like medication. Yeah, we <laughs> love it over yeah. here. If you can throw some Viking in our way, kick that on down the bunny trail, we'll be good to go, my man. <laughs> so yeah, typically when people meet me, they're like, oh cool, you're, you're an astronomer, you know, I'm a Pisces. And I used to say, what the f- <laughs> give me a freaking break, man. But now you know what I do? I say, you know what? Um, your horoscope, it's it's troubling. You know, that lump on your ass, that's cancer, buddy. Yeah. yeah. You better get go, that taken care of. Go to WebMD. Can you imagine WebMD and uh, 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 hypochondriacs in 2020 and 21? Oh, it'd be great. Holy shit. Dude. Yeah. They should make a reality. Like, fuck, fuck. Fuck all this my 600-pound life stuff. Mm-hmm. I want to see hypochondriacs on WebMD all day. That's what I want to see right So now. do I. And, and Pisces is a water <laughs> sign, by the way. Um, so I know I, true. You name the only thing that I actually Wait, am. Wait, Pisces is a water sign. That's early or late February, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So is that when he was born, too? I don't know. Yeah, is that when you were born? No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a Pisces. I, I don't discriminate against them. There are mm. actually uh, g- good connections between astrology, astronomy, cosmology, and cosmetology. And uh, we'll, we'll 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 talk about the original question, which was about cosmetology, <laughs> <laughs> which you guys are expert in too, as I can tell. You're you're manscaped to the, to the extreme. Yeah, Although yeah. you got to get them as a sponsor. They offered to sponsor my podcast. How we, can they not be a sponsor? We of your were. Uh, they 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 were for many many years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dan's holding up the the dot kit. Oh, nice. There. The bag, the lawnmower, <laughs> um, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. They're actually in San Diego. Those those brothers. Yeah. yeah. Those they're cool. Uh, great. They're we great. like those I guys. Thought, you know, for my brand, such as it is, you know, my my brand should be telescopes microscopes lab coats so i i decided against it you know ari advised me against it but anyway yeah uh cosmos cosmetology cosmology so cosmos means and i know you guys are scholars of ancient greek i don't have to tell you that mm-hmm. but it means face or beauty mm-hmm. or appearance and that's because the night sky you know where you guys are where i am you look up at the night sky it's freaking beautiful mm-hmm. you look at it and you have a connection to the otherworldly and so there's a connection between your face, the appearance that you present to the universe, which has a different meaning. Uh, but uh, so they are connected through that meaning. Of course, there's nothing in common with them. And uh, people do mistake that. Uh, they mistake me for an astrologer way more often than a cosmetologist. Uh, although one of my daughters wants me to do her nails uh, much more frequently than I will admit to being curious about. Ah, look, we're all curious. It's whether or not you've actually had it in, you know. Uh, or taking that curiosity to the next level. Obviously, your curiosity in life led you to become, uh, geez, I, I, f- I feel like you're like the just world-renowned dude who uh, uh, you got a book, losing the Nobel Prize. Like I, I feel like you're one of those guys who will win eventually one day. <laughs> well, I mean, For real. Like, and it's, it's, it's weird to say. It, it is, uh, it, it is uh, become just like the Academy Awards or some political element to it at this point, which is whenever you introduce things like profit motive 
or 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 identity and politics into things that are fucking science like healthcare and and education and this it always becomes problematic right yeah yeah and that's why you wrote your book right because it's mostly political uh behind the scenes and the wrong people are getting the 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 awards and it's discouraging yeah. young scientists and everything else uh, you can yeah. you know speak more on that obviously but uh yeah, yeah it is interesting because you know once a year the nobel prize pops up you see all these people nominated and you're like wow what a weird list of people that they've actually chosen for this but who actually deserve it and it's chances are it's probably guys like you but it, it usually goes to, to somebody else yeah, well, so for a long time, you know, it didn't, it wouldn't go to people like me because, like our brother Ari, I am of the uh, Semitic persuasion. Yeah, and actually, Jews were forbidden to get it for a long time. Actually, Einstein, uh, brother Einstein, he did not uh, receive the Nobel Prize for something like seventeen years yeah. after he came up with a little thing called the theory of relativity. Well, yeah, no big general, deal. general and special. So the miracle year for the audience, the miracle year of nineteen oh five, when he published these four papers. It wasn't until what 1919 did he actually won or 1920? I think the experiment yeah. where he where he took pictures of the sun and the cur uh, uh, light bending around it because of uh, mass and gravity and that whatever the fuck. Uh, I think it was 20 that he actually won and 19 that yeah, they yeah. took the pictures or something. Actually, like that. can you can you fill in? For, I'm I'm teaching in about an hour. <laughs> Dan, can you can you do you mind? You know, just like filling in. That was. I think uh, yeah. If, if anybody pulled out a camera phone and recorded the presentation that I would give, you would lose your job. For yes, sure. yes. <laughs> Be a lot of dicks drawn yeah. on that chalkboard. Yeah. <laughs> just hidden dicks. That's the name of yeah, my presentation. Yeah. So for uh, for many years it wasn't possible, and and even now it's very political. Uh, how it's given, but actually the book was more, you know, the book has three chapters on, I happen to have a copy of the book right here. I'll there send you guys boom. a copy. Pop. So you see the book yeah. cover. There are these three kind of remember like when you're a kid, do you guys ever do choose your own adventures when you're oh, yeah. a kid all the time? Yeah. Oh, I love those freaking books, man. So I wanted it to be an adventure possibility where if you didn't give a crap about the Nobel prize and you just want to learn about the, you know, come for the cosmology, maybe, maybe not stay for the Nobel prize. I said, Publisher, please print the cover. Uh, please print the uh, the borders of the cha only three chapters about the Nobel Prize. Print them in gray. And they're like, sure. And I didn't know. I never written a book before. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the rest of the book is a memoir. It's really a memoir of what it feels like to seek, to strive, you know, and not to yield, even though you come up short. Because let's face it, you know, the Super Bowl Super Bowl is this weekend, right? Yes, yes, it is. Okay. So who who you know, even Tom Brady does isn't in the Super Bowl this Sunday, right? No, he is. He, he absolutely is. Okay, is. Yes. So he is. Okay, so he is. <laughs> it's, but that's that, that's crazy, right? He that defies every form yeah. of logic in every sport ever. He's been in ten out of the last twenty. Exactly, which is crazy, but he hasn't been out of 20 out of the last 20, right? So sometimes he's had to come as close as you can humanly get and fail and then sit with that for at least a year, sometimes longer. Mm -hmm. And so I thought about that. I was like, how many people out there, you know, aspire to win the Nobel Prize? Very few. But how many out there aspire to make partner at the law firm, to make, you know, top dog realtor, Ooh. to make, to make you know, 82nd Airborne, right? Uh, you know, whatever. And they come up short. That doesn't mean they're losers, right? I mean, I lost it technically. Does that? I mean, I'm a loser. Yeah. If I don't learn any mistakes and humility from it, then I am a loser. But the point is, I wanted to write a book about what does it feel like to compete at an elite level, come up short, but say, I'm going to dust myself off <clears throat> literally from the cosmic dust and come back stronger than ever, better than ever. And, you know, use it as a message of resiliency. So only three chapters are about the Nobel Prize. It's not really about the Peace Prize so much. I will refer you to a, a, a super, a super gal who wrote a book about the losing the Nobel Prize of, of the Peace Prize and how evil, distorted and, and wretched it's been. And you know what's funny about that book? So after you write a book, I don't know if you guys ever wrote any books. Do you plan to write any books? Uh, ah, Dan, your cos you know. cosmology textbook I'm going to get. My, my last one might have been number one in the world, but who's counting? You know, nine straight weeks <laughs> in the New York Times bestseller list. I, yes, I've written a couple, maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe a couple. But, uh, right, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know thing. if you knew that in advance, uh, but I hate you for allowing him to go. Oh, to I that. love it I so much. I wanted to let him gloat. Come I on. love it so much. The, uh, the Thank you. Thank you so much. You're my favorite person so now, now, Brian. But imagine if you write your next book and it doesn't get on any list or it's like it's it's not. So the, the point is, even if you make it, you know, in my religion, Moses, he's greatest humble man who ever. He never got to the promised land. So how many mm. of us don't get into the promised land? And so you actually spend more of your time. You know, I'm a pilot, private pilot in my in my limited amount of spare time. And, you know, there's a notion that if you if you fight a headwind. 
uh, going flying from Austin to Dallas. I don't know, maybe that's an hour flight, and it's a hundred mile an hour headwind. And then you come back right around and go back to Austin from Dallas, and it's a hundred mile an hour tailwind. Naively, most people, even physicists, I ask that too. Does it take the same one hour plus one hour, namely two hours? And they'll say yes, but it doesn't. Because imagine if it's like 500 mile an hour tailwind on the way there, you're like, yeah, I get there in half the time. But then on the way back, you make zero progress. In other words, you're going to spend more time of your life in a headwind, battling a headwind, than you will benefit from the tailwinds of your previous successes. So enjoy the resistance of the headwind and just enjoy the process. That's what I came out learning from this experience. Right, man. man I, I, I have a problem with that. Well, um, I'm, I'm more of a don't, I hated the process. I'm, I, I'm more of a don't uh, fight the current kind of guy, mm. right? I mean, if you, anybody that's, that's an accomplished swimmer or anybody that's done rescue swimming or anybody that teaches anything like that knows that uh, fighting against the current is, is ultimately, I mean, you have to understand what life is, right? I mean, there's some things you can yeah. control and some things you cannot control. Yes. And uh, yeah. for, for the New York Times bestseller list, for example, despite the fact <clears throat> that his book was selling the most copies for weeks and weeks and weeks in a row, it was still mm -hmm. only what I think it was. It, it peaked at number five. Number five. Although yeah. it was <clears throat> number though, one by like 20,000. <clears throat> I mean, I mean, it was a, a 13,000 copies, right, in yeah. the world. And the well, problem with it is the New York Times bestseller list, what everybody strives to, is a curated, yeah, a curated list. list. And which yeah. is a good they analog. Use. It's you a edited, yeah. Right? That's yeah. a good that's a good analog for media in general these days because media, particularly cable news, has become a curated set of facts, which is not mm -hmm. facts, right? Information is not curated. Information is information. Yes. You know right. what I mean? It is all yeah. relevant in some way or another. So you don't get to choose like uh, 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 an avenue of information and ignore all the rest. That doesn't make sense. That's confirmation mm -hmm. bias. And that's what we in science always try to avoid. That's the number one thing we try to avoid exactly. is confirmation yeah. bias, right? And the greatest scientists in history have succumbed to it. And, you know, all the more so us, you know, I have all these finger puppets here. I like, I like to finger the great scientists. Mm, um, yeah. So sue me. So, so Galileo, he's my hero. Actually, I just got the rights, the permission to translate. Can you believe this? Galileo wrote one of the best books in human history. It's called The Dialogue mm. about the two different worlds world systems and he was battling forces ranging from in, in truth the church a little bit but also his other scientists who believed that the earth was the center of the universe right. that was a natural i mean if i ask you guys you guys are you know like educated people you're not physicists but uh if i say prove to me you know sometimes i do this with my kids i'll say what's six times seven they'll say 42 i'll say no it's not and i make them actually go through it and and that process of going through and mm. proving it is true <clears throat> but if i ask you prove that the earth is in motion around the sun how would you do it uh, shadows that's, on the ground. That's how we originally discovered it, right? That's like, the curvature of the Earth. You're right, 100 percent right. But, but that, I'm talking about the motion of the Earth around the Sun. Yeah, Ooh. I would. I would go. So we're friends with Kyrie Irving, um, <laughs> who's a flat earther, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh -oh. I'd oh, probably man. call Kyrie. Um, <laughs> no, I, I understand what you're saying, and 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 to to go back to this process, like a, a guy as brilliant as you. Like, because me personally, what I was saying was I hate, I hated the process and I still do. I hate the journey and everybody who says that shit to me. Like I, I <laughs> no, I, if you're talented enough in your field and you hit whatever marker you're supposed to hit, you should be number one and get that thing, whatever that thing is. Uh, I guess my question is this, because you're an unbelievably fascinating guy. We had a guy on a uh, high school football coach, Kevin Kelly on a couple of days ago. The winning is high school football coach in, in yeah, high school right now. He was fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And he, he's able to go out every year and be number one. And there is a number by it. And nothing can beat that. Right. And things that we do, uh, writing in particular and or the Nobel Prize. Right. It's somebody else's shit that you have to deal with and whether or not they're <laughs> going to allow you to be number one. How do you enjoy that process when it is clearly flawed and, and it's not. Well, be, truly who the best it'd, is. It'd be different if it was your peers deciding, right? I, I think the same thing about uh, like the most valuable player award in any major sport. I would much yeah. rather hear what the players have to think than what some right. old ass or the Hall of they, Fame in baseball, especially. Right. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, these yeah. old yeah. ass yeah. dudes that have never played baseball in their life decide who is and isn't worthy of a yeah. Hall of Fame induction. It, it, that's that and is, it's worse it's with maddening. the Nobel Prize. It's like 
you know, 500 du- mostly dudes in Sweden, you know, many of whom were notoriously anti-Semitic. In fact, yeah. one of the one of the ways that you do, you know, possibly win this, unless you know someone comes into your office uh, who is a Nobel Prize winner and leaves it on the couch when you're doing a podcast with him. Like, <laughs> is that true? <laughs> that's how I got. That's how I got that one. Uh, but actually, you know, it's 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 interesting because in general they get things right. But here's the big problem that I have that, you know, I want to talk about with you guys, if you're willing to kind of go there with me, sure. yeah. is this, is we hear this a lot. We hear trust the scientist, you know, tr- what does it mean to you guys? You guys are super, I, I follow you guys. I listen to you guys. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll, you'll treat me the same way you treated professor, professor Scott G. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding about that. I heard Dan go off the other day. Scott anyway. G took a hard right though, didn't he? Um, well, yeah, a hard yeah, left, I guess. Yeah. Hard left. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, he's, you know. He's BFF with Kara Swisher and all. Anyway, oh, yeah, I don't want to yeah. go there. But I do want to say you guys are educated people, right? So I say to you, listen to the scientists. We are the party of science. Trust the scientists. What is the coded message that's getting conveyed there? How would uh, you interpret it? Well, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? when the like, coded... What do you think it means when a politician says, "Trust"? I trust the science. I follow the science. I'm the party of science. What is, what is being held? What is science being held up as when someone says, trust the science? Well, I mean, yeah. In your opinion. Science, There's no science, right or wrong answer. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a concrete standard of evidence. It's, it's, uh, that's what I say all the time and what we've lost because there are no objective media, uh, news media companies anymore. It's like having your pinky on the pick guard of a guitar. It's a placeholder right there, so you know where all the strings are at all times without having to look. Right? It's it's a standard, I guess, under which yeah, I play. I only operates. play the iPhone, so I'll take your word for it. <clears throat> right, but it's. I mean, that's essentially what it is. When you say trust the science, the the presumption is that the science is above reproach and above politics. When it, when in fact that is not the case anymore. We know that very. I mean, yeah. Uh, not not to get into some. Cra- I'm, I'm not a, a climate change denier, but no, they made right. a they made a lot of com- of, of com. Uh, 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 They've made a lot of statements over the last 50 years or so, most of which have been hyperbolic and absolute nonsense in some cases, right? I mean, you can see, you don't have to wait to see the evidence because we've already lived those 50 years. We know exactly whether or not their predictions were true. Yeah. And they're not. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's the whole problem. People, do, you know, so we've never lived in an age where, where the average person has so much technology, so much right. power and power is technology. I had Michael Saylor, who's like the biggest mm-hmm. proponent of, of Bitcoin in human history on my yeah. show. And he's like, money is power. And I'm like, you're unmarried, no kids. Like, what are you going to do with all? How many yachts can you water ski behind? And he's just like, money is power and power is the ability to convert energy uh, in a short amount of time to accomplish it. I'm like, are you forming a mercenary? Army? Like, what are you doing with it? <laughs> Yeah. And he's like, no, no, he's actually benevolent. He's starting a university. He actually already did called Sailor Academy. It's mm. free. He wants to give away a million uh, bachelor's degrees in STEM, not in like, you know, whatever, uh, <clears throat> undersea poetry or whatever. But getting back to the question I asked you guys about science, what I think it's like, and I'm interested in you guys, especially with the military kind of background mm. that that you, you have then. But, but when I hear trust the scientists, first of all, I don't know a single scientist who trusts scientists. In other words, it's not like I think you're a liar, you cheat on your wife or whatever. No, I just, that's not my job. My job is to verify, not even to trust, because if you trust the scientists, we'd be flat earth, we'd be, earth is the center of the universe. We would never have Einstein. And that's actually a demoralizing message to teach to my children. Same with climate change, which I believe in anthropocentric, anthropogenic For sure, uh, climate yeah. change. I mean, that's obvious. But, but, yeah, but if I tell my kids, I've, I've got, I'm blessed to have kids. If I say to them, that's it. There's nothing you can do do about it. I, I say, I think back to like, do you know what the number one problem on Wall Street, the power center of all economics back in 1800s, the late 1800s, you know what the number one problem was that thought to be crippling effect on the economy was back then? Uh, Jews? Polio? I mean, in in in, uh, yeah, in, Ger- in in Germany, it was Jews. To it, be honest, it, I'm not making it up. That's I mean, that's that no, was no, no, no. The... I know, I know. But I'm saying Wall <clears throat> Street. The the clue is Wall Street. It was horse shit. Yeah, it was horse shit. Was piling up. They couldn't. The brokers couldn't get in there. So like, imagine you said like the way we're gonna solve you know uh, the horse shit <laughs> problem is we're gonna like you know have horse diaper whatever. It was a bit, yeah. but no. What came along to solve that vexing you know possibly existential crisis was science or it was technology. Right. And never have we lived in an age where so much technology is in the control of an ordinary person <laughs> who has zero comprehension how it works. And therefore, when the words trust science is said, I fear personally, and I'm curious about you guys. I fear it means obey scientists. Right. I mean, look, it, your job as a scientist is to question everything, right? And everything. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it's, we never, we never make progress without that. Now look, there's, there's gotta be some room for the possibility that at some point we re, we arrive at the correct answer on certain things. 
but we still like, I mean, for the work you do in cosmic uh, or in, in the CMB in general, we still have mm-hmm. no fucking idea what inflation really is. What happened there? Right. Why? Why our universe in one thirty-two thousandth of a second expanded way farther than it should have, and what the implications of that are, and all this stuff. I mean, it, and that's what makes the work you've done so impressive, to be honest. And it's, I, it's funny that you mentioned. I never really thought about that before, about uh, about the tribe uh, getting kind of boxed out because there have been some notable. Nobel Prize, Heisenberg, obviously, Einstein, but Leonard Susskind never got one. And he's the guy that really developed the ideology of string theory that led to M theory later on, right? So it's. Uh, yeah, uh, he's a friend of mine. He's been on the show. But, yeah, I yeah, love yeah, Leonard I mean, Susskind. And, and he, ha- he I mean, never ha- even got considered, really, did he? I mean, to be honest. Well, yeah, really I mean, he's still chance. alive. I mean, p- there's a lot of problems with the Nobel Prize that I, that I get into in the book, but the most cruel one is this one, which actually benefited one of my close friends now who's who's won the Nobel Prize, but at the expense of another person. And this was the following fact of the Nobel Prize that I think is the most cruel aspect of it. First of all, it can only go to three people. That's not the cruelest aspect. That's just like totally bizarre. It's a relic of 1900 science when the Nobel Prize was established. It was just like a lone genius in this basement working around. Nowadays, I have 300 collaborators on the right. Simons Observatory <clears throat> Project, and I can't do without a single one of them. But the most famous example occurred just just uh, three years ago four years ago now uh where we discovered not we my my experiment but my friends on the ligo experiment mm-hmm. discovered directly the evidence for what are called waves of gravity right so the shuddering <laughs> shattering of space time itself the reverberations thereof produced when two black holes each one 30 times the mass of the sun collide at nearly the speed of light so just imagine like you can't even comprehend it but no. it was such a violent explosion it was a it was a, a truly uh, you know universe shaking event mm. that was detected. Okay, now that event where these two black holes crash together, we think it occurred 1.2 billion years ago. Okay? okay, and these waves travel at the speed of light for 1.2 billion mm. years, so it's 1.2 billion light years, r- more or less. Now those signals were traveling. If they had arrived 10 days earlier, there's a guy who ended up dying before the awards was made and, and, and could have been eligible. He died. Basically, if the announcement had been made 10 days earlier, he would have won it. And my good friend, Professor Barry Barish at Caltech, he wouldn't have won it because there's only three people that could have be allowed to win it. Right. So the preclusion <clears throat> against what's called posthumous or after death awards is very cruel because it rewrites science. They, they now will edit out. Well, his accomplishment really wasn't that important uh, because, you know, and he, and he died, you know, so it's those aspects <clears throat> have, have caused for the first time, the Nobel prize committee, which is the ultimate power broker in science. You, you think of it as like the Oscars or whatever. Yeah. The Oscars are similar in a certain sense uh, in that they recognize, you know, there's a, coll- there's a cabal, there's you know people behind the scenes you don't know who it is uh but they award at least they award it to like 10 people like any number of people can win it they get <clears> posthumous <throat> awards they do things ironically in a, even in the me too movement era yeah. they do things better than science is doing it that's yeah, true it's it, and it's <clears throat> it is interesting i think uh when steven weinberg who's the only name i remember from the standard model uh nobel yeah. prize uh here at texas mm-hmm. a&m actually but he yeah. had there were there were quite a UT, few people. ut austin yeah. yeah well was it ut austin i thought he was at yeah. a, or did he was he a professor at a&m for a while or was it all at austin he's a, i think he was at harvard maybe when he won it and mm, then he moved okay. to, to austin but he's did, there at austin. i actually invited him on my show and he rejected me like many other really <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, he's old as shit now, so <clears throat> yeah, he's he's old. He's up there. But he's uh, you know, there were only... but his BFF did come on the show. His guy named um, the guy by the name of Shelley Glashow. Mm. Yeah, it was him and two other people that that that's right. Yeah, got the award. But like, there were, I'm sure there were more people. And I wonder when uh, you know, uh, have, have there been any uh, Nobel prizes out of CERN? Because there's hundreds of people working there, or Fermi no, Fermi Lab, or any of these other places, right? I mean, there's a yeah, lot of yeah. people working on these things. So the Higgs boson, which was famous yeah. discovery a few years back, and that and that actually Weinberg and and this guy Abdus Salam, who's oh yeah, uh, that's one, one. yeah. Yeah, so they um, they made contributions, but one of my professors, I went to Brown University for graduate school. One of my best friends, professors, mentors, and heroes was a man by the name of Jerry Goralnik, and he contributed to this discovery. There were actually seven people that were contributed that could have been called their name instead of Peter Higgs, but it turned out Peter Higgs at Edinburgh, he had this like PR machine behind him. It wasn't like his fault. It's like this is part of what I call the science industrial university complex, where we have like a little discovery, like there might be life on Venus. Uh, oh, okay, what well, is the biggest news in history? And like, and then we got to spin it up because that means there might not be, you know, uh, the the biblical interpretation of, you know, it just gets right. totally blown up out of control. <clears throat> and then that goes on the front page, as it did with my experiment, Bicep Two, which is behind me in the poster here, front page of the New York Times. 
for the announcement. And then when it, when an it, or if, and when it is retracted or proven incorrect, inconclusive, maybe even falsified in some cases, uh, it gets printed maybe in section B 17 on the Saturday edition. So it's like the public gets this total misapprehension of the way that science works. First of all, press conferences never used to happen. It's like making scientists and cele- into celebrities is another part of this, of this industrialization and usefulness of scientists, which I, you know, I coined a new term. You're familiar with the term u- useful idiots. Mm. I think scientists <clears throat> sometimes are useful geniuses. Like they are allowing themselves and my colleagues are allowing themselves to be used for political purposes for short-term gain. In other words, now they'll have the backing of a given political administration you know, whatever that may be, I'm, I'm a political atheist, basically. But but the, the point being that when you allow your science to be owned by a political party, or they say, we're, we're the party of science, and uh, it, it distorts the meaning of the word science, which is pure <clears throat> knowledge. That's what the word right. means in Latin, as you guys are, of course, no doubt, familiar. <laughs> very, yeah, we, very, we, yeah. we, uh, Whenever we're offline, we only speak Latin. That's all we do. <laughs> That's all we do. Uh, and Vino Veritas, by the way. Um, I, I'm yes. curious as to you. I, we don't have to get too political on this, but like um, with, with with Biden running. Right. And he says one of the things that they were, he was running on was believe in science. We're going to believe in the science and the scientists and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. What's your reaction to that? Because, you know, for every scientist who has facts and data and figures about one thing, you can always find another scientist who can counter that. Right. Yeah. What, like yeah, what, when you yeah. hear phrases like that, is that what you were talking about of like, hey, man, it's it varies and it's different yeah. and we should always challenge it. Well, first of all, there's no such thing as science. Science is never settled. Science is never case closed. Yeah. Those concepts are mm. human constructs and scientists are human beings, despite the stereotypes that we're walking Wikipedia's and all we care about is facts and data. And, you know, but we're human beings. We want to see our theories, as, as Dan was saying, confirmed. Like right. there's just a need for it. And everyone from Einstein to Galileo to Isaac Newton, they all had that. The I mean, Hawk, is, Hawking with the information paradox, he really leaned into that one pretty hard. Totally. I mean, and it, even in black holes and even in what's, you know, so he wrote this most famous book in modern mm. science history called The Brief History of Time. Mm. And that book, I reread it. You know, I tried to read it when I was 16. Yeah. I couldn't understand it. Right. You guys think I'm so smart. I still need to sing the alphabet song to remember what comes after Q. But but nevertheless, I read that book when I was, I didn't under, now I understand it with the swagger of a, of a you know, of a practicing cosmologist for right. 30 years. Right. And so you've, you've, I could, you've said in other interviews, by the way, that you think that Hawking would be like severely depressed if people were still reading his book a hundred years from now, unless it was yeah. to reference it for like, what here's what we used to think. Right. right that, yeah. That's kind of the, that's the backbone of science is to constantly be progressive. We don't know shit. Remember that? Uh, <laughs> do you remember, uh, what was that movie about, uh, uh, about, um, the basketball player, the young guy shoot uh, pistol Pete Maravich, that movie about him when he was a kid. Yeah. That scene where he's in the gym with his dad and his dad's holding a basketball mm-hmm. and he goes, uh, this is everything you could possibly know about basketball. Here's what I know. And he draws a big circle on it yeah. and he goes, here's what you know. And there's a dot. We're that we don't know shit. Yeah, we, we know some stuff, but we have no fucking idea what the hell's going on out there. No, and to be fair, Hawking leaned into everything, obviously, because he yeah. didn't have a choice. Um, but, uh, you know, I, that's a great joke, um, and I'm yeah, going ta- to catch hell for it. But um, That's I, fine. I, I love it. R.I.P. Hawking, Stephen Hawking, big fan. <laughs> uh, big fan of his second wife, too. How he was able to get another wife uh, and just say, you know what, man, I'm in a wheelchair and shit's all fucked up, but I'm going to divorce you. Um, and then you know I, what the secret is, though, behind how he seduced her? No, I don't. I don't. And I've joked about this for years. What What is it actually? So the way that he did it is in G- So, you know, he had this wheelchair yep. and the wheelchair had a speech synthesizer built into it. It turns out his nurse, who later became his wife, when she was previously married to a, a technician, a student or you know, colleague of Hawking's, he programmed Stephen Hawking speech synthesizer, which then was the only modality of communication that he could use to therefore seduce this man's wife. Oh, that's really no funny <clears throat> way. That's really funny. There's a new book coming out. I'll put you in touch with the guy. If you're interested, it's called Hawking Hawking. It's about like what I called. Uh, I did an interview with his late great uh, with his the late great Stephen Hawking's closest mm. collaborator. 
a guy at Caltech named Leonard Mladenu. Yeah. And I said he was kind of a businessman. Like I heard him speak once, literally, in uh, when I went to a, an astronomical meeting in London one one time in the 90s. And I and somebody asked him a question. It was back when he could still move a finger. You mm. know what he could do with that finger would put you boys to shame. But anyway, <laughs> sure. That finger uh, typed out a response to the following question, <clears throat> which was, Professor Hawking, why did you write this book that it's rumored that no one has ever gotten to the end of, and no one who has can understand it? And he, Stephen Hawking, I remember him saying, because my daughter needed to pay for college, and I all laughed and everything. But only upon reading, you know, this this more recent book about the friendship between Stephen Hawking and this man Leonard Mladen, now which I'm looking for here, I did an interview with him, did I realize, you know, and he had to create a, a corporation. It was basically Hawking Incorporated, mm. this like mythic <clears throat> figure. Because why? And it's not so. Any, the guy used to have to be turned in the middle of the night every two hours to let this uh, tracheostomy or whatever drain. He needed to have every part of his body wiped, and he would get sores. And and towards the end of his life, so he needed cash. He needed to have cash flow. And so part of what he had to do, and this book Hawking Hawking is about the mythology of it, but maybe a little less tender than I'm presenting it because you know I actually can can. Understand understand that like if all you have is this hammer and it's your body or it's your it's your it's your image then <clears throat> you have to make ends meet I don't, I don't fault him so much for that although some of the stuff in his books are total bunk in other words he had an agenda his agenda was to disprove <clears throat> the need for god he said if god exists god only has two purposes within the laws of physics one purpose to create the universe the second purpose to establish the laws of the universe in a brief history of time, I went back and read it. I don't mm -hmm. think that very many people could actually understand it. And even my close colleagues who were mentioned in the book by name, the Einstein professor of physics at Princeton University, Paul Steinhardt, you know, we have high level conversations. Our colleagues have no idea what he was saying in that book was basically assuming that he was right that the universe didn't have a beginning of time the way that we think about it. In other words, it wasn't like a simple Big Bang where it began right. the way that Genesis 1-1 would suggest. Therefore, he got rid of step number one. Remember I said, he said two things God could do. The first one was start the universe. No, nope. Hawking said, my theory, which nobody believes in right now, started the universe. And then to establish the laws of the universe, he used what Dan was saying before, Susskind's M theory. And that's, by the way, that's not proven. There's not yeah. a shred of evidence that string theory is right. In fact, yeah. many people think it's wrong. Like, actually well, I mean, look, th right? there, there, there's this phrase that people like to use. Weinberg is one of them. Uh, when the, when the math is so elegant that oftentimes it is true. I mean, that's, that is, that's a, that's a, that's a kind of a shaky ground to stand on, to be honest. Yeah, Although direct. that whole thing with, uh, <clears throat> What, what, the, one of the most impressive things in all of modern science history that nobody that I've ever met knows about, I'm sure you do, but that, uh, that conference at US, USC in, two, or in uh, 1995 where Ed Witten showed up, everybody's arguing over five different versions of string theory, and he's just like, uh, you guys are all fucking idiots. It's the same thing you're talking about, and here's the proof. And everybody's like, oh, shit. So I, I, like the, I like the characterization of Ed Witten as the guy that when physicists need somebody to do math, they call Ed Witten. That's that's like being the Michael Jordan of math right there, but you don't get you don't get a Nike sponsorship for that, unfortunately. Well, the other guy you guys should have on is my friend Eric Weinstein. I don't know. If oh yeah, we love him. him. Portals, right? I mean, mm -hmm. he, he's, he's on the part. Yeah, he's uh, he's one of my best friends. I'll I'll happily yeah, sure. you know send an email. Yeah, that uh, he's that interview he did of, with uh, Douglas uh, uh, Murray, Murray is one of my favorite conversations that I've ever listened to in my life. Honestly, I mean, it's so he's, important he's that people fearless. listen to this The guy right is now. totally fearless. Yeah. He has he doesn't care. We offend. He's actually a progressive. I mean, he considers himself an old fat, but you know. He's out there. He'll defend like the uh, the you know the conservative. He went on Ted Cruz's podcast. Oh, yeah. and Michael Knowles. <clears throat> yeah. So anyway, yeah. These these things. There's as much kind of sociology of physics or of astronomy of any other science as you'll find in the sociology department or in the corner. And to think that scientists are unified monolithic. That is scary because I think scientists do that because they underestimate. I hate when people say, can you dumb it down for me? No, I'm not going to freaking dumb it down for you. I'm going to treat you like a, like an adult. Yeah. And if you don't understand it, then you've got to do, do some homework or stop wasting my time. Right. But I'm never going to insult my audience. And, and that, to me, 
is what good scientists should do. They should say, this is complicated, but you have every freaking right. Look, you guys pay my taxes in some part. Your audience is paying my freaking tax, your, your, my salary rather. Mm. You got, I wish you guys paid my taxes. No. Nope. You guys' taxes are paying my salary and allowing me to play with toys that, by the way, don't tell Gavin Newsom, my boss, but I would do it for free. Yeah. You know, I love my freaking job. <clears throat> I love it. I thrive on it. I always say it's the, it's the hardest three hour a week job in the world. You know, uh, it, it, it's, it's the only job where you have like permanent employees show like you guys got to earn your money if you guys don't earn you know whatever the podcast is going to go out of business or right. whatever or you know promo codes I guess, yeah dude if i know promo if we codes, don't yeah promo let's do codes. one right now yeah, teach dude. me how to get that that sweet ghost that sweet ghost cash look at, look at that dude yeah. did, did you give me a segue there <laughs> Yeah. Not only are you one of the smartest dudes on the planet, you gave me a fucking <laughs> sponsor segue. I'm learning from you guys. I listen to you guys. Come you guys on. Are my, you guys are my professors. <laughs> well, By the way, you ever notice in like, you know, one thing that really pisses professors off, you ever watch, you know, like one of these pornographic movies? Uh, no, we never. We would never you know do that, that mo- no. You never do that. Okay. Fine. No, so, no, but no. I was actually I'm watching cold. porn five minutes before we started this interview. Yeah, that's why it was late. Yeah. Did you see him clearing his pockets? It yeah. was like, hey, man, you know? Yeah. Do you know that most of the the so-called professors in the pornographic movies, they don't have tenure? Oh, you know shit. That? Really? That's, ah. See, that's a problem in academia right now, though, because uh, what people don't know is that over the last uh, 30 years or so, the professor salaries uh, uh, commensurate to inflation have risen by about 27 percent. The administrative fees have risen by 2000 percent. Yeah. So yeah. if you're bitching about your student loans, don't blame him. Blame those cunts that run the university. Not that you're calling them that. I am. Yes. I yes. call everybody cunts, even my friends. No, so I, know you do. I know you do. I know you do. I was yeah, waiting yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for that. I thought the C word was going to be CMB there, Dan. But, but well, no, I mean, you know, know, cosmic microwave background. Well, cons. let me let me say something mm. about that because because it is true, and and actually we're getting you know we're getting more and more you know kind of course load. We're getting more and more students that we have to mm-hmm. teach. The universities are growing. Like, how do you differentiate between UCSD and UT Austin, like or UT uh, T- Texas? A&M? Like, do I know some special physics, or does Harvard? Know some special right. physics that UCSD hasn't learned yet. No, frick, no. You know, I mean, I went to the best, you know, Ivy League schools or whatever. But the point is, is that you have to differentiate yourself via the different perks you offer. Like we have ocean view dorms here. You know, you guys come and visit. I'll show you our ocean view. Do- like some freshman is moving in or you know, whatever. They're looking out to the to the sea. Like I didn't. Ha- I went to undergraduate in Cleveland. You know, I, went, I was at Case Western Reserve University, a proud Spartan. And, you know, what's so interesting, and, and you guys will know this so much better than I do, because I'm in San Diego, and until this last year, the Padres hadn't made the playoffs in the last 17 years, but I'm told that uh, it's very difficult to get into the major leagues. Like, mm-hmm. it's very difficult, right? How hard is it to get into AAA? It's also pretty hard, right? Yeah. <clears throat> it's not like, oh, it's easy. So in academia, you may not know this, because I, I don't expect that non-academics would know this. To be a professor is kind of like the major league. In right. fact, there are more people in the major league there's the same number of players in the NBA as there are professors of cosmology. Maybe it's twice as many in the NBA as professors that do what I do that are tenured. It could be even more. So, uh, but the level below me, the analog of triple a ball uh, is, is called a, being a postdoctoral scholar. Mm-hmm. So this is after you get your PhD, you want to show that you can do original research, new, new information. You want to be independent of your graduate student advisor, who's kind of like a mentor, kind of like a father or mother figure, whatever. And that then takes you to a level where you can say, I could be that professor. Now I could be, a. it is as easy. You can walk down the street and almost get a postdoc. Like we're desperate. I'm hiring, trying to hire like five to 10 different people to do a postdoctoral research gig in my lab. So now imagine that though. Imagine it was like simple to get into the AAA and impossible. It's a totally bizarre out of market force environment. And the whole academy is turned upside down because of forces like that. And because of, yes, the bloating in the bureaucracy that we, that we have to participate in to, in part to, to differentiate ourselves from the Harvards, from the Caltechs and Stanford's. Right. Yeah. I, and you know, look, you're always going to go through things like that. Unfortunately, I think, you know, well, it's like a, it's almost like a reverse uh, creative destruction. It's like mission creep almost like this. Mm. I mean, it, it happens in anything in, in sociology and government. There's always uh, there's always bloat. There's always uh, uh, unnecessary bureaucracy that gets added in like intersectionality, which is something that, uh, uh, Douglas Murray and Weinstein have had a lot of conversations about that I've listened to. Just That's we right. we we've decided that we're going to break every single human being being down into all their elements, 
then we're going to create this sophisticated but kind of vague hierarchy of which elements like if you're gay you're up here but mm-hmm. if you're straight you're down here and then all mm-hmm. this stuff and we just we we turn people into the sum of all their individual parts instead of worrying whether or not they're a good fucking person or not you know what yeah. I mean? It's right. nonsense. And, 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 you know, if you're rich or if you have the right connections, you can cut the line and yeah. uh, get your problems solved faster. I mean, you, you said you're a, a fan of the Padres. Does Garth Brooks really need to, to play a, a spring training game, for Christ's <laughs> sakes? Like, no, but he's fucking rich enough and powerful enough that they were like, yeah, let's trot his fat ass out at shortstop and let him play. <laughs> well, a he looked innings. pretty good at the inauguration, though. Well, look, he sounded great, too, but uh, he shouldn't be playing shortstop for the Padres <laughs> no, he played for any spring Come training on. game. No, I think it was shortstop, right? Oh, he definitely should not be playing over there. Yeah, yeah. That, that the hot, was it the hot corner? No, that's yeah, not the and they lobbed yeah. in a 82 mile an hour to let him hit it, you know, up the <laughs> middle once and make him feel great about himself. But it's the same way with any profession, though, where, you know, if you're, if you're rich or have the right connections, you can cut the line. I'm sure if you're friends with uh, Gavin Newsom, like you personally in real life, right? My buddy, yeah. Yeah, your, your buddy. My, my boss. You, yeah, my, 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 my boss, yeah. You'd be eating at uh, French Laundry and talking right. about the new budget that you're going to have yeah. uh, for your department and all the people you'd be able to hire. But chances are you're probably not bros mm-hmm. with him, so you're stuck like the rest of us assholes, right? Yeah, but, yeah that's right. Yeah, so, so for me, yeah, those kinds of things are the reason that I want to go in academia because I said it is a meritocracy. Right. And, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, it's, it's hard, guys, because – what 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 Dan was just saying, like you want to pigeonhole somebody. Do you know why we want to do that? It's because we like shortcuts. We like we're hats. lazy. Yeah, we're lazy. Yeah. And so if I can sum you up and say, oh, you're black or you're a Jew, like yeah. I can say this or that. And people will say to me, even my ultra conservative friends, you know, I've had on the podcast, Heather McDonald, who's like, she's like one of the most courageous people in the world. She's like, do you really think like when people and they're choosing the Nobel Prize? Uh, they say, well, we shouldn't give it to this black man like no African-American has ever won the Nobel Prize in physics. And so do you really think that? And I'm like, uh, it, what, do you think that science has changed and that scientists have changed in 100 years, right. 80 years, 70 years? Because you know what, Heather, uh, back when, uh, you know, back 50, 70 years ago, they wouldn't give it to people of my ethnicity, of my right. religious persuasion. <clears throat> yeah. What makes you think that scientists have changed and now they're like altruistic and they're, they're not? No, of course. By the way, you know how many women have won it? There's one kind of behind me. There's only four women in history who have won it? Who and are two they? of them. Mary are Curie's got to be one of them, right? She won the very first yeah, one yeah. in uh, 19, 1903. And then it, there was a drought until one of the professors here at UC San Diego, Maria Mayer, oh, yeah, she Maria won Mayer, it in 1963. Yeah. And by the way, when she won it, the San Diego Union Tribune, the newspaper, the headline was San Diego Housewife Wins Nobel Prize. Oh, boy. Uh, well, you know what our headline is going to be for this show, Jesus obviously. Christ, Nobel dude. Prize loser, <clears throat> Brian Keating. Uh, <laughs> and that's going to be I, I special that, right. guest. Because yeah. uh, that way, you know, in the search engine and all that stuff, it's it, yeah, it'll, it'll pop up. I mean, people up. say, oh, you're, a, you're just you're a liar. You know, yeah. you're, you just have sour grapes, Keating, because you didn't win it. But the interesting thing... Unlike, you know, like a, a, a kind of a zero sum game, like science is an infinite game. Like mm-hmm. you can't get to the end of it. Yeah, there's so no finish line. Say, yeah. 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 Oh, so it is, done. I mean, I guess it is. In, in you're done tri- with science. <laughs> it is, it is somewhat intrinsically difficult to decide what is and isn't important. It's, it's like art almost. I mean, who knew in, in 69, whenever Susskind started putting out uh, papers on string theory, and of, of course that was extrapolations on hadrons from, from Heisenberg's earlier work. But nobody really knew what the fuck he was talking about at the time. They didn't understand how important it was. And maybe it turns out after all these years that it isn't important, right? Whenever somebody comes up with the TOE or, 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 or somehow unifies the quantum world with the fucking macro world and we, we decide, oh, that's – I mean, that was cool at the time, but we don't care about that anymore. How many yeah. – how many, I wonder how many Nobel Prizes for physics especially have become irrelevant. Like the information yeah. has become irrelevant over time. There are some that are given out that are totally wrong, and, and there are oh, yeah. some that are given out that led to like evil being, per, you know, perpetrated on Earth. I'll give you an example, Dan. You you, you might know this, but there was a famous Jewish German man mm. in the uh, 1900s named Fritz Haber, and because of Fritz Haber, you and I can have a drink of Scotch whiskey. We can eat our breakfast in the, in the morning because almost half of the fertilizer for half of the food on Earth is made from the process that he invented called the Haber-Boss process. Right. Anyway, it's <clears> called <throat> nitrogen. There's a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere, but fertilizer needs to take that nitrogen out and put it into a chemical form that plants can metabolize. Right. And that process he invented. Well, he invented another uh, an, another chemical molecule, and it went by the name of Zyklon B. 
And actually in 1918, 1915 rather, he advocated and personally suited up for battle in World War I when the deployment of chemical weapons and chlorine gas against the Allied troops killed 50,000 people on the Allied side. This guy, three years later, went on to win the Nobel Prize. Yeah. And yeah. so you think, like, there's no morality that's associated with science. That's the thing I want to get across. I'm doing a video for Prager University, mm -hmm. which, you know, caused half my fans to, like, oh, send yeah. me, you know, yeah, hate yeah. mail. And, yeah, you know, I've already done two. I did one with Michael Knowles last week mm -hmm. about Galileo, which we can chat about because it's really fun. He's an interesting guy if you want to ever get in touch with him. Mm -hmm. um, but the uh, but the the subject that I was talking about is, like, you have all these scientists, but the word science it means knowledge. It has nothing to do with wisdom. You know, they say like knowledge is knowing a tomato is a freaking fruit, but wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. Right. You know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, so, there's been a lot of unintended consequences. I mean, I, yeah. I would imagine pretty much everybody that worked on the Manhattan project at some point, uh, except for maybe the Nazis that were involved in that. Yeah. We're like, Oh, we probably shouldn't have done that shit. Yeah, I mean, even when, you know, Fritz Haber won in, in 1918, it was for chemistry. And it was like, dude, you used it to kill thousands and thousands of people. Like, how do right. you get an award for that? Well, I mean, it's, it's again, just, it's just the, show the time person of the year isn't always the best person of that year. I think Osama bin Laden was the time person of the year once, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Wh whomever the most, I mean, and, and in that way, time got it right. Like, that was the most influential figure of that year, and that's the point of that award. Unfortunately... We, it's become, uh, like like we discussed, uh, a curated process. Mm -hmm. And you can't, I mean, it's honestly, I, I am a capitalist. I get it, man. But you cannot, there's certain things that you just simply cannot introduce profit motive into. Things that are things that are uh, that are necessary for us to continue living and building and progressing our society cannot have a, an intrinsic profit motive to it. I'm not saying you can't make money off of it. But if the entire point becomes to leverage whatever influence or technology or whatever you have just to make money, then it becomes a runaway effect at some point, right? It gets off the yeah. rails. We have this bloated, we have the student loan crisis, or we have, you know, uh, people that are making science. The Nobel political. Prize. The yeah. Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize is the I mean, biggest it's, it's export ridiculous. of Sweden, you know, like <clears throat> Volvos and the Nobel Prize. It's well, like, they also it's make the, eight, they also make the, uh, the uh, javelin. Uh, which is a uh, fucking yeah, that's a, uh, surface right. to air. Did they make Greta, Greta Thunberg? Was she Swedish? She's Norwegian. Ah, mm. Norwegian. Well, well you can. She, but that's better. Yeah, that's better for her because the Nor the Norwegians give out the peace prize, yeah, and the yeah. Swedes get out give out the other. Now, ones. do you yeah, think so what what are the chances that a that a homogenous society like Sweden is doing a lot in the field of uh, you know? progressive politics like <laughs> understanding that northern europe isn't the only place on earth and that there's people other than white people that they should probably pay attention to at some point probably not a good chance of that right no not anytime soon they don't give a shit yeah they yeah. don't care um although iowa's basketball team is still under that same guy i don't care uh, about iowa i don't i don't starting white five starting five i've never seen that i don't believe century. well princeton <laughs> you're right, yeah. you're right but i don't i don't believe uh that iowa exists no, and it doesn't. Ohio State beat them last night and proved that theory yet again. <laughs> um, for you personally, though, um, our, our co-host, one of our co-hosts, uh, Jared Taylor, who is not here. Um, yeah, where's he, he, Well, he's probably got E. coli or who knows. No, his daughter's in the uh, hospital, actually. Okay, yeah. so it's, it's legit. Yeah, she's But fine. did he run her over with a motorcycle? No, she's got a staph infection from getting scratched, scratched by a cat or some shit. Who knows? Okay. I mean, it's some a, it's, wild animal yeah. on his own property. <laughs> um, but he's, he's said this on this show numerous times. Um, especially with the military, and I think it relates to your field as well. He thinks they should give more awards away, same with the, the Nobel Prize. So that way, like young scientists or, or people that are coming up in the military have something else to look up to and aspire to and achieve. When there's only three in your craft, right? Yeah. That's just yeah, yeah, simply so, so. not enough to be like, man, it doesn't seem like an achievable goal when you set out there. Like, you know, yeah. we, we were discussing the New York Times bestseller list earlier. At least yeah. there's 15 slots. So, yeah. you know, per week, there's 15 chances and then there's different categories of it. And you're like, all right, I, I thought it was possible growing up. Right. But then, you know, when but you it achieve doesn't, it, it you're, is. You're but, right. It doesn't seem, let me ask it doesn't question, seem Ross, very. This is important. I, I, I haven't, you know, I've got friends that are best, you know, like Michael Knowles wrote this blank book. And it was number one. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Ben Shapiro is a friend of mine. But, yeah. you know, I've never really asked him that. And, and I want to ask, a, like the day after you got on that list or a week mm -hmm. after you got on, like, you're back on the you're back on the horse. You're not like saying, "Oh, I won it." And and actually, there's an old joke in the Nobel Prize that the Nobel Prize is a ticket to your funeral because you never do anything important after you 
win right, yeah. because people think of you as this ultra genius. And that, but, mm-hmm. but I want to ask you another question. Like, um, so, so let's just stipulate that the Nobel Peace Prize is rotten and corrupt to its core, right? I mean, mm-hmm. first of all, from from an objective perspective, who has caused the most peace on planet Earth? What organization caused the most peace? Has created, has allowed for most peace. Not saying it's perfect, but what entity on Earth? You know, from from all different organizations, the World Health Organization, you know, whatever you want, has created the benefit uh, of of mankind, the most peace on Earth. It's so hard to say, and here's why: because Everybody's backed by funding that is for a, a certain motive that like you wonder why they're doing it. Um, it's kind of like meeting somebody in real life and you're like, man, why is that person so nice? Why is that the nicest person I've ever met? Um, most of the time, it's because they're not influenced by anything else. Therefore, you don't know so many, too many New York Jews. Huh? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but I actually know a lot. They're all okay, my reps. Yeah, agents, managers, lawyers, everything. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's uh, that's Hollywood, baby. Shabbat um, shalom, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> not yet. We got a, we got a couple hours. Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> no, but 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 it's, no, you're right. But, it's but people but who thing, aren't I, influenced I, by anything. So that asking me that question of of who has caused it or what organization has caused it. It's really tough to say because it's also what people believe in, right? Because there's certain people who are believe in a religion, so therefore they don't do certain things or mm-hmm. um, things like that. But uh, I don't know. I think and that's the U.S. Great... military. I'm just going to say it. I'm not, I'm, the U.S. military, just by fact, you know, when they show up, people know they're not corrupt. They're not going to kill people. They're, you know, that we operate by some code. And we've, look, look, we've never won it once. The Red Cross has won it like three or four times. You know, terrorists have won it. Uh, Yasser Arafat won yeah. it. You know, and, and, and uh, Tao Duck. Or a Kissinger one. Now I'm not saying we're perfect, but if you were objectively about people, but I want to ask a deeper question. Why does humankind care about this little three inch piece of, this is actually Hanukkah guilt, by the way. It's not, it's not actually a golden medallion. Uh, it's, it's a piece of chocolate, but, um, <clears throat> but why do we care about it? Like, why is it? And I, I found it very interesting. And I explore this in my book that, um, well, you guys, and I'm, I'm not, I never proselytize. I'm not it's mm. against my religion, technically to proselytize. So I'm never, is, yeah. don't take it the wrong way, but I'm like, everybody has a religion. Even if you're like Richard Dawkins, you're hard. That's your religion, Lawrence Krauss. You know, these are these are people that are devout. They just don't happen to. They have a secular religion that they adhere to, and that's fine. I've actually spoken at this, you know, secular, uh, you know, agnostics meetings and so forth. But well, to be honest, even, most modern Jews are secularists, right? Cult- yeah, I mean, that's it's, right. it's cultural religion, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it exactly. is like you said, it is a religion of a sort. I mean, it's uh, it a lot of people will use phrases and, and they're, you know, I guess uh, in, in some ways tongue in cheek or even sometimes kind of irritating. But like my religion is love. But that yeah. is a possibility. Right. My like I, I consider my personal religion to be uh, the fucking like truth and empathy. Those are the only two things that really matter to me because it's the only th- it's the only things that really make human beings progress, like having all the information and realizing that no matter what that information says, we still have a duty to take care of each other. Those, those are the only things in, in life, yeah. really, that, that even matter. And those right resonate with, 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 but yeah. my point is like, when, when I meet somebody who says I'm an agnostic, mm-hmm. um, well, like how do they distinguish themselves? Like if an alien, just somebody from space who's super smart, which we, we should talk about aliens, by the way, too. Oh, but, yeah. but anyway, an alien looks at Earth and sees Brian Keating, and I call myself, a, you know, an agnostic. But then he looks at Richard Dawkins and Richard Dawkins is an athe- is an atheist, and he doesn't do anything. But Brian Keating doesn't go to church, doesn't go to temple, doesn't go to mosque, whatever. And how do you how would you functionally distinguish yourself, Dan, from someone who is a like? Do you have any rituals? Do you have any? And I'm not saying like denigrating at all. I'm just saying how do you functionally? Because I'm a behaviorist. I, I believe mm-hmm. that your behavior shape your your attitude, that your rules right. outperform your tools, whatever you want to say. And so like. How do you how do you enact how do you instantiate let me put it that way how do you instantiate your religion which I'm not grappling with with what you're saying at all right yeah yeah I mean how do I how do I like I it's I, we I, it's principles right for us that's that's the way at least I organize my life and I, when I say mm-hmm. principles not, not necessarily like Ray Dalio's book but we do mm-hmm. one, one of our other shows my my other show with Dakota Meyer uh, uh, it's called American Party Podcast the idea is to yeah. be as you said uh, politically agnostic right but it's not politically agnostic it is a realization. <laughs> that these polar opposites can't possibly both be right, right? And there's a very small chance that either one of them is right on everything. Actually, there's no chance that either one of them is right on everything. And there's even a small, there's a small chance that they're right on anything at all because it's so politicized <laughs> at this point. So uh, <clears throat> the principles are things that should be ubiquitous, right? Like anybody should be able to apply that to their life and it works, 
because we are all, you know, despite cultural differences and things like that and, and, and experience, we are all essentially the same. We, we have Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? We have, yeah. we need food and shelter and safety and all this bullshit. Um, so it, the way I would say principles is the way I do it. So principles yeah. like I'm going to do something and it, 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 it ultimately, it, it's, there's so much context that, that is required to answer that question. Like what is important to you? What's important to me is that uh, I influence things in a positive way at the <laughs> lowest possible level I can first and then work my way upward. Right. So yeah. deal with your family first, then your yeah. tribe, then your state, you know, yeah. then your country, then the world. Right. Yeah. Because that, that's why <clears throat> that's why I really like the 10th Amendment, not because I'm anti tax necessarily, but it's because as a voter and as a taxpayer, if I let's say I spend ten thousand dollars a year on taxes, if I spend the bulk of that at the city level, that means my tax dollars have the most influence that they possibly could have because that is the place where I live most of my life. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that's an important thing uh, to, that happens. So in context, I would say it depends on people's value. What's important to you? You know what I mean? Right. And what's important to us is shaped largely by our experience. Like Ayn Rand, for example, is super anti everything that has anything to do with anybody controlling anything, regulating anything. But that's because she grew up under a situation where everybody was controlling every, every single right. moment of her life. Right. So we overreact to things like that. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know the answer. But to, to me, it's it's prioritizing whatever whatever I can do, you know, to to make the world better, uh, whether it's mm -hmm. uh, shooting terrorists in the fucking face or mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, giving a sandwich to some dude on the side of the road. Right. Right. So I don't I don't know how to really. No, I think it's, that. you know, Judaism's concept is like, you know, perfecting the world, taking it along. But those right. like you have to have I'm um, a pilot, as I said, you know, if you are going to the moon, you know, if you how big do you think the moon is? Like if if the if the whole sky is 360 degrees around, how how big do you think the moon is in degrees? Do you guys know? 14 uh, by 14. No. 14 in degrees in by 14 degree, degrees. Yeah. No, I, I, I've, I've absolutely no, I, wrong. I have no idea. In um, degrees out of 360, probably like. 30 degrees something like that yeah yeah that's 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 like 100 times too big it's half of one degree oh, it's actually the same size as your fingernail so hold your fingernail oh, I guess out it's true, yeah the moon's out <clears throat> the moon subtends us and it's it's the same size as the sun so i'm not you know as an astronomer i'm saying go out look at the sun with your naked eye maybe with the <laughs> i'm not saying that uh for all the disclaimers out there all the people that uh, they're gonna this but but when you think about it if you're off, that means if you're off by a quarter of it, let's say you're trying to hit the center of the moon exactly with a bullet or a laser or whatever. If you're off by a quarter of a degree, you'll miss the whole freaking moon. Right. So like you got to get on track early on. And like for me, I don't know if you guys are parents. I, I actually, I'm, I'm not aware. But, I am, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when you set your kids off, like I've been thinking a lot about this with my kids and, and you know, there's this cliche that people say like time is the most valuable of all commodities. And I, I say, no, it's not. And then they'll say, well, yes, it is. Cause you can't make time back. You can make money back. I'm like, um, actually innocence is the most perishable of all quantities of, in my opinion, I don't know what you guys think. I'm curious, but because like, and it could be innocence of like your kid is just like this beautiful, innocent thing. It comes into the world with like no prior Bayesian, you know, kind of influence on what it, what the world is about, but, or it could be like, like the other day, my wife told me, she kind of says, did you hear about these cops that were killed in, in Florida? I'm like, I don't, I don't need to know that. Like, mm. I know that that is possible. There's absolutely nothing that I can do. I'm not going to like, now I'm going to sound really smart around the faculty. No, I wish I was innocent of that fact. It does me no good. So my, my thought is like, we should be innocent. And uh, like, you guys have done stuff that you, you can't not have, you know, some residual from, but on the same token, it doesn't mean that going forward, you can't preserve whatever innocence that is. Now you guys work in the news, but you know, whatever. So it's a little harder for you. Um, and there, but that gives you the, the, the power of directing your attention to those things that really matter and paying attention to that so that you don't have to be innocent when things like evil or, or whatever right. come about. That's my philosophy. Well, I've spent my life being the opposite of innocent and I don't mean yeah. that in like a, I am a dirtbag. No, for I know. Sure. Yeah. But like I, but the, the bulk of my adult life has been spent uh, doing harsh things to yeah. other people. Um, but I do feel like uh, I could see that from your perspective. Like I would, I would appreciate, uh, being able to make sure that other people were able to do what you're talking about. I don't, that's not in the cards for me, obviously, because that's not, no, I know that's not and, and, my experience or who, who I am as a person, but it is nice. I mean, that's the whole thing when people say, 
uh, thank you for your service. That is something that military people have a very hard time responding yeah. to because they don't know how to, they don't know what to say to that. Yeah. You know what I, mean? I know my brother-in-law's in force recon yeah, yeah. and he's, so he's it, been in Afghanistan 21 times yeah. and, it's, and it, it's hard to respond to that. Like, what do you, what do you say? So what I've been saying lately is, uh, uh thank you for being worth fighting for. Make sure you continue to be that. Right. Because right. ultimately we all give up something somewhere to make other people's lives better, whether we know it or not. Right. Yeah. If it's taxes or it's sacrifice, you're a cop, you're a teacher, you're a nurse, you're any of these. You're just a mentor to some fucking kid in your neighborhood when you're a teenager. <laughs> even I mean, there's right. all there's so many different things like that. So, yeah, I, I like that idea. Yeah. But, and Ross, what about you? Are you are you like religious of any way? Yeah. Or, I'm so not, I'm, I, to, to go over kind of the last three you know questions you brought up here, um, yeah. you know, with uh, uh, religion and awards um, and innocence um, and what the, the, the most valuable thing we have is. Uh, all of that changed when I had children. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, religion in particular uh, was raised Catholic, went, uh, yeah. you know, received communion, all that other stuff. Um, as, I, as I got Me older, too. I was in the C&E crowd, you know, Christmas mm -hmm. and Easter. Um, mm -hmm. And then after that, stopped going to church. Um, not because, you know, I, I didn't believe in anything that was going on or blah, blah, blah. But uh, how do you disprove everybody else's religion and say that that's... Uh, Hitchin, Hitchin's razor. What can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. That's how it's not on you to p prove a negative. I'll say that. Correct. And, th and that's what I believe in. Therefore, um, for me personally to practice any form of organized religion anymore, didn't really make sense when I don't know the answer. Um, therefore I also don't look down on people who believe in whatever they believe in, right? Mm -hmm. Unless it's doing harm to others. Uh, and, and with my children, I, I think that I'm going to lean that same way, uh, in regards to, uh, like awards and stuff, why it was so Sorry, important. Ross, will you expose your kids? Cause I, I do feel like, and this is something that like Dawkins will say, he's like, no kid is born a Christian. Like it's child abuse to say your, your child when it's born is, is Christian where Jews is different because <laughs> Jews is like an ethnicity and right. racial, but, but, but I'm curious. Because I feel like if you don't expose your, my, my parents are both, you know, pretty devout atheists, even though they were both Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I actually went through and I had, I became an altar boy in the Catholic church when my mom remarried. And then I was an atheist and then I became a practicing Jew, not Orthodox, but practicing. Right. But anyway, I'm <laughs> curious because if you don't, I feel like I expose my kids to religion of their, of their birth. And yeah, of course I changed my religion three times, you know, whatever. But if you don't, if you go in the beginning and just like, there's no, like no kid is going to come up with like, oh, there was this person who died for my sin. You know, it's just not possible right. for a kid to do that any more right. than it was possible for Einstein to come up with theory of relativity when he was five. Right. So, so therefore, if my kids are curious about it um, and they want to learn and or know or have questions about it, I am happy to point them in that direction if that's what they want. Me personally, as a parent, to try to pick a, a, an organized religion <clears throat> for them, it's it, that that one's a tough one for me personally. Well, I mean, it's, what's the point of doing that? Because I mean, th that there's th it's actually one of the great confluences of nature and nurture. The uh, the decision of young adults to choose a religion. It's right. one of the most fascinating things that ever happens in someone's life. And I don't uh, want to set them on a path where they feel like they have to follow one because mom no, and but dad wanted them to. You, you also don't want the absent. It's only fucking sex education, right? Right. Yes. Like you don't want the, you don't want the ignorance involved there because they're going to make a bad decision. They're going to get tricked into some weird cult bullshit at some point. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's so pervasive. I mean, religion, as, as uh, Brian said, it's so pervasive in our society, whether they, it's called religion or not. I mean, Joe mm -hmm. Rogan's yeah. religion is fucking DMT and fucking elk. You know? what I mean yeah. Yeah. but it's it's <laughs> nonetheless a religion right yeah. so it's it is what it is so yeah I think uh like for personally my first degree is in is co in comparative religion I don't believe in any of this shit but <laughs> it is a great way to understand the human mind it's also it's also really good to understand <clears throat> nuance and how we think about things and the, mm -hmm. the constant struggle we've made to understand our purpose, whether there is one or not, right? I think that's yeah. really important because it reflects so much on us. The gods that we create reflect mm -hmm. so much on us and where we were at the time period. That's right. I think it's fascinating, right? Yeah. Why would you not study that? Like, I think it's real. I think it's important for children to be exposed and study that because they'll never know human beings better than human beings involved in religion, particularly in the in the creation and progression of religion. Right. Uh, but that's why I studied it. Oh, yeah. And, and but I also want them to have their own curiosity and interest yeah. in it um, to to pick any one organized religion to me personally as a parent is tough because then I'm telling them essentially, all right, well, this is what I studied and you should study this and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I, but I to Dawkins point, he does make a good point. If he if he, he thought this, there's this anecdote, I think it's in. Um, 
God, I don't remember which book it's in, but he, he talks about how when he was like 13, 12 or 13 years old, he was like, shit, if I was born in Egypt, I'd probably be Muslim. So is there really any real intrinsic value to the fact that I was raised in the Church of England? Probably not. Right. 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 Like that isn't it, it's not that there's no value there. It's that that's not proof that it's real. That's no, no, not proof that it's real. But right. you guys that were born in America. Also, mm-hmm. yeah, your life would be different in a whole host of ways, uh, a part of which is religion. But, yeah. you know, what's curious to me is like so what I like about Judaism is is that the word Israel, I don't know if you guys know this, but the word Israel, like El means like Eloheinu means mm-hmm. God. And Yisrael means fight. It means fight with God. Oh, and, yeah. and that's that's kind of noble. Like Islam, I love it. You know, one of the best, I rank on, on academia a lot, but one of the best things about academia is literally, guys, I have people, I have students in Antarctica. I have students from from Central Africa that were Muslim. I have Saudi Arabia, and I've got kids from from Northwest um, Washington State, whatever. I get to meet people from all cultures all over. And you know who else gets to meet them? My family when they come over to my house. Mm. Different cultures. I go to their house. I go to their their lands, and I learn about them. You know, Islam is lovely, and wonderful, and 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 I have great friends and and great. Con- Islam means submission, right? Right. I mean, you guys know that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, submit to what? Right. So submit. So I'd rather be fighting with God and not knowing, because I think as a scientist, Scientist, uh, my obligation is, as we said earlier, it's to question everything. And that does mean I don't just, oh, everything, you know, it's, it makes this nice little package. No, it's, I'm going to fight against it. But the key point is, like, as Ellie Wiesel said, he said, mm. uh, you know, a Jew can can be without God. He, I mean, a Jew can be, you know, angry at God or loving God, but he can't be without, without thinking about God. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, but, that's that's what the word, the, the Hebrew word for death actually means uh, absence of God, right? Basically, like. The separation means, yeah. between yourself and God, basically, is what it yeah. means. But right? doesn't yeah, that drive you crazy it. as a scientist and as a you know a professor of co- cosmology? Only if, if you'll never only have if, that answer. No, only if you th- only if you think that it's a fucking race with a finish line. Yes, and it's not the infinite game. It's well, an infinite well, life. frontier. I mean, look, there is you're born and like, then you die. Why, Are you worried that you're not going to find the answers imagine, before you die? Look, Einstein <laughs> fucking probably led himself to an early grave trying to find a theory of everything. Right? That's right. He wanted it so badly and it was there was no way he didn't have the equipment to be able to measure these things. And that's I mean, that's also one of the reasons it took him a long, longer time to get his uh, Nobel Prize. But either you know, way, what's funny about him is, is that, you know, he came up with seven things that were each worthy of a Nobel Prize. Right. And he won. He won one Nobel Prize. Yeah. Um, there's a woman by the name of Rita Hayworth who was like an actress in the mm-hmm. 50s. And she won like six or seven Oscars. And you're yeah. like, shouldn't there be a correlation? Like, shouldn't there be, a, if it's meritocratic, mm-hmm. uh, shouldn't someone who's super brilliant enough to win a Nobel Prize be more likely than not to win another Nobel Prize? And yet the opposite is true. And so there's some extra forces that are at work. And so I don't judge things. The, the only reason I want to bring that, and maybe we could do a part two. I got I to gotta teach a bunch of students in six minutes, but, but I do yeah. want to do a part two with you guys. But the thing I want to leave you guys with is like what is your idol for me and i'm very candid i got f-18s from miramar taking off right now i love those guys <laughs> yeah those yeah. are my front my my boys over there hornets um, <clears throat> top gun and um but the uh but, but what i want to leave you with and the listeners out there uh, is this quest that I'm on? It's a continuous quest. Uh, uh and we don't fight the current. You want to conserve energy, but what right. is your idol? <laughs> What are you living to impress? The truth, the truth has got to be the idol, right? Like if you if you believe what you believe and what I believe, that there's mm-hmm. no way we're going to solve all these things in one lifetime, then it becomes incumbent upon you not just to work as hard as you can in this lifetime, but also to make sure you're passing your knowledge on and there's there's some kind of baton being handed off to the next generation. It's so important for that to happen. Absolutely. Because like, you know what that is? That's the dream of a thousand generations. Yeah. It's time travel. Yeah. It's teleportation. I don't know, Dan. Do you have kids? I forgot. No, no. None of them. Okay. So, but but you, can be, you are a mentor to millions of people, and mm. you can be a father figure as well. So Ross and me and, and, and you can teleport. We can teleport our values yeah. into the future. That's something that Elon Musk would kill to do, like yeah. his body. But who cares about your body, right? Your body is dust and ashes. What is your most important characteristic is what's inside. And right. that's what you can teleport today for the future. Right. Yes. And my, mine, I know mine. It's curiosity. And mm-hmm. uh, every mm-hmm. single day, and I've, I've said this numerous times on the show, that's why I love doing podcasts mm-hmm. every single day is because I get to meet people that I would never get to meet. In, in all walks of life, including you, our next guest uh, was just pardoned by President Trump. He's got a crazy story. Um, <laughs> and, and it's that curiosity that I never want to lose. Therefore, I'm not really chasing an idol. I'm more or less chasing uh, an endless pursuit to stay curious every single day in life. Mm. And hopefully uh, there isn't an end point where I'm like, man, 
figured it all out and I'm all done and I'm just going to play. There's, there's actually a really good episode of Future, Futurama about this where he discovers the theory of everything Professor Farnsworth does and he becomes deeply depressed. Right. Yes. And then he then there's another type of matter. And he's like, oh, what, what's this type of matter? And he gets happy again because there's something else to pursue. There's right? something else to be curious. You know I mean, about. it's, it's what, yeah. You know. Otherwise, what the fuck are we doing here, man? I mean, we, if exactly. we're if, if if there's no uh, uh, curiosity, no progress, then we're just chess pieces on a board. I, 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 mean? I agree. And since you've got to teach, uh, mm. we have this thing called the drinking bro of the week, which is someone who has inspired you or helps you become the person you are today before you get out of here to go. Uh, mold the young minds of uh, the next great generation. Who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? I'll give it to a man who had a vineyard of his own in his own mm. home prison, Galileo Galilei. He was uh, in prison, but it's the kind of prison that Bernie Madoff would literally kill for. <laughs> I had a, I had the honor of hosting a conference there in 2015. And Galileo uh, studied, grew his own grapes, and he had a famous saying. He said, the sun <clears throat> goes around in the, in, in the sky, or we go around it, however you like, and, um, and it still takes its time to ripen a cluster of grapes <coughs> so that we can enjoy a drink or two together as yeah. friends. Cheers. 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 Boys. Shabbat Shalom. It's great to meet you. Hope you we as well. Uh, check out Losing the Nobel Prize by Brian Keating. It is available everywhere. Where else can they find you, Brian? Uh, so I got a podcast called the Into the Impossible Podcast. Everywhere you get podcasts, I get great people like Ben Shapiro, mm. Eric Weinstein, Noam Chomsky. So I'm kind of like you guys. I, I achieve neutrality by going so far back and forth to the left. Right. I'm emulating <clears throat> what you guys are doing. And then on YouTube, I'm Dr. Brian Keating, growing a, a following there. Twitter, Dr. Brian Keating. That's about it. Awesome. 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 Thank you for your time today. We definitely got to do a part two, man. You're uh, an unbelievably yeah. fascinating guy, and we'd love to have you back. Let's do it. Maybe when the Nobel Prizes are, are awarded in the fall, we can do another one. I'm doing yeah. a book about uh, about lessons from laureates, what we can learn from these top performers. So maybe we'll Sweet. get together in person. Yeah. Yes. Anytime. Come down to Austin, Texas. We Anytime. would love to have you for sure. I would love it. All right, brothers. Awesome. For Brian well. Keating, Anthony, Anthony Holloway, I'm Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bros Podcast. Good night, everyone. <laughs>